Hello. Thanks so much to the Westmont Library for inviting me to come speak about fun food trends from past decades on this recording. My name is Amy Alessio and I'm a librarian and a cookbook collector. I have 2000 vintage cookbooks. Many of them are pamphlet size and various um, bookcases in my home. And I always put pictures of Jell-O to start this show because I kind of got my start. I was experimenting with my mom's joys of Jell-O when I was little. One of the things I made were these broken glass uh, cake mold and pie. And I made the pie in the cake form. And I was fascinated with the pie because it was lined with lady fingers. And I think I used like black cherry jello mixed with Cool Whip. But then you have to make three flavors in a shallow pan and cut them into cubes and fold them in. And so while this is really pretty, and a lot of people recognize this as a jello favorite from past decades, probably like the 70s, um, it is what is a ton of work. And also the texture is a little weird with the cubes of jello. But today we're going to talk about uh, favorite food trends from past decades. And so let's get started on this culinary journey. So let's begin. I like talking and writing about foods from past decades, vintage cookbooks, because it stirs memories. And a lot of times they're nice memories, like the memory of a special dress worn at an exciting occasion. People usually remember good or bad a dish. Um, like for years, I made fun of salmon mousse from the 50s, uh, and my mother loves it and hasn't had it that much. She remembered making it when the Irish cousins came to town, and she, that was the only time they came here. And she remembers making it with dill. Um, I tried to recreate it, and it was terrible, but she and my dad really enjoyed it because they were remembering that occasion. These are my grandmothers. It's Grandma Curtin on the left and Grandma Alessio on the right. I kept my name when I got married. Um, and they did not write many things down. So the cookbooks are kind of a window to the past for me, for when they were uh, young immigrant women in this country raising their families. Um, those women could stretch a dollar, but they made everything. And I always say that Grandma Alessio um, taught me that bad foods are still good memories. Uh, she turned 89 seven times. She just didn't want to turn 90. And, <laughs> and she... Uh, was still trying to cook her Italian gravy in her spotless apartment at that age. And she couldn't see. She had some help. Uh, and I don't know what she put in it. It was terrible. It tasted awful. But just the memory of her still trying to make that gravy uh, for my my husband and I and my sis siblings and their partners. I mean, we would give anything to have it in that form even now. So let's go way back. So both World War I and World War II um, encouraged people at home to conserve waste and to make the most out of the foods they had available. And especially in World War II with the rationing and the coupons, uh, the government was producing ideas, uh, recipes for people to um, conserve and to use what was at hand. And so uh, you had things like wheatless day menus or meatless day menus as shown here. And these are from uh, Resolver Library at Cornell has a whole thing about World War II and one foods. And so substitutes were big. So like corn syrup and honey for sugar, fish or cheese instead of meat, a stretching things. Um, and these, if you think about it, a lot of the diets we have today are versions of this, uh, special diets, certainly wheatless that they have to have, but vegetarian. And so while ours maybe sometimes are trends or sometimes needed by people with special diets, they were asking everyone to do some of these things. And people did to support the troops and to help us. Uh, and they said that the advertising campaigns in both wars were that foods will, that will win the war. The marshmallow cream, one of two main ingredients of a fluffernutter, was invented in the earliest 20th century. So a man named Archibald Query invented something he called marshmallow cream in 1917. And then some sisters, Amory and Emma Curtis of Melrose, Massachusetts, invented snowflake marshmallow cream in 1913. Um, so this happens a few times in culinary history where people are working on similar things. Uh, we'll talk about this with brownies, too. But during World War I, Emma Curtis published a recipe for Liberty Sandwich, which consisted of peanut butter and snowflake marshmallow cream on oat or barley bread. Uh, and this was in foodtimeline.org. This was published in a promotional booklet sent to her customers and maybe the original fluffernutter. But then with sugar shortages during World War I hurting sales of Query's marshmallow cream, he sold his recipe for the marshmallow cream to two men, Durkee and Moore. Durkee and Moore is still the company that produces marshmallow cream. 
uh, and they came up with Toot Sweet Marshmallow Fluff, and they continue to sell it as Marshmallow Fluff. And the sandwich made with peanut butter and marshmallow cream continued to be popular, but was not called a fluffernutter until 1960, when they created the term as a way to market it, if you can imagine it. They have trademarked the fluffernutter um, name. <laughs> and they have different versions of it. I have some product cookbooks from a Jerky and More, and they even have like a prune uh, fluffernutter shake at some point. Doesn't that sound appealing? As promised, we're going to talk about brownies. So brownies have um, an origin in about three different places. So people were working on similar things around the same time, and they didn't become popular until the 20s, which is why I put them here in my presentation. But one uh, version is that the Palmer House created them in 1892. Some people say they for the recipe first appeared in 1897 in the Sears Roebuck catalog. And the earliest published recipe could be for banger brownies in the Boston Daily Globe in 1905. Um, and they figure it, in that version that, that people use chocolate cake batter, resulting in a cake that didn't rise. They left out the baking powder. So, but they became popular in the 20s, as I said. So there are four types of brownies uh, generally recognized. And there's fudgy. Um, which have a minimum of flour and no leavening, and they melt the butter for a dense, fudgy outcome. Those are probably the most popular ones, the type that most people think about. Cake-like, that have less butter and more flour and a little bit of baking powder. Chewy, have extra eggs in them, or maybe different types of chocolate. And then blondies are really butterscotch bars. And this is from the kitchenproject.com history, and then they have brownie tips. So which version is your favorite? Early 20s, Girl Scout cookies came on the scene. Um, so as early as 1917, five years after Juliet Gordon Lowe started Girl Scouting, uh, a troop in Michigan baked cookies and sold them in the high school cafeteria for a service project. And other troops thought this was a great idea for fundraising. So by 1922, the magazine from the Girl Scout National Headquarters uh, came up with a cookie recipe. And she, the person who invented this, uh, Florence Neal, estimated the approximate cost of ingredients for six to seven dozen to be 26 to 36 cents. She suggested that the cookies be sold for 20 or 30 cents per dozen. Now today, they go for about $5 a box. Um, and I definitely still support the local Girl Scout troops. And I like the Samoas. I don't know if you have a favorite or the Thin Mints. But look at this, the simple sugar cookie. And this recipe, you're supposed to be able to make six to seven dozen. Um, they would have to be pretty small with these ingredients, but it's kind of funny to think about the way the prices have changed so much. And, but it's been almost 100 years. Food trends that have come out of the 30s um, from foodtimeline.org. They say candy bars are still going strong with the introduction of Snickers, Mars bars, Kit Kats, and Rolos. But there's a depression, so folks are heading back to the kitchen. So you see lots of things, uh, people more cooking at home. And again, we see substitutions like we do during the war times. Um, but on the outskirts of Massachusetts, there was the Toll House Inn and Mr. and Mrs. Wakefield ran it. And in 1930, she was experimenting, chopping up a candy bar to put into her cookies. And she called them Toll House Cookies. The recipe has still not changed a lot. The one that's on the uh, chip package. Uh, and the cookbook is not from that time period. I got it there. Uh, and I get a lot of things when I was uh, traveling at different places, tourist locations. One of my favorite souvenirs is cookbooks. On the right is mock apple pie, which is another depression phenomenon. Uh, and this one, it shows up a lot in church cookbooks. So the filling tastes like apples, but it's made out of ground Ritz crackers and butter um, and different spices. And this... Um, recipe. Um, I'm going to try to include some recipes in the description of this video, uh, but this is one you can find a lot. Try mock apple pie, doing a search for it. Some people say that it's really good if you use the cheese crackers. I've had lots of folks when I gave these talks live at libraries who had tried this one. I have not tried it yet. I am planning to do it this summer. Have you tried mock apple pie? Depression cake is one of those recipes that's kind of a make-do recipe that shows up a lot of times in various cookbooks. Um, there are other recipes like this. Uh, one egg cake, uh, flourless cake uh, is another version of it, only that has uh, richer and more refined uh, recipes now. But depression cake was what they 
made when they didn't have other materials. So the ingredients can include little or no milk, sugar, butter, or eggs. It has been known as war cake. Um, it has been known as in depression cake, boiled raisin cake, or eggless, milkless, butterless cake. Yeah, that one doesn't sound too appealing. Um, so boiled refers to the boiling of raisins with sugar and spices to make a syrup base. And some people do it that way. Versions of the boiled raisin cake go back to the American Civil War. But the depression cake, and I've made this version a few times because my mother remembered having it, although she says it never quite tastes the same, although she likes the versions I've made. And that's true. Uh, different versions had um, over time or whatever people had on hand. And some of the things that people use in these were uh, for liquid. They could use coffee, water, or apple juice. Um, some people had a little sugar or shortening, raisins or pitted prunes, uh, apples, dried apples, sometimes pears different spices like cinnamon or nutmeg, uh, chopped almonds or walnuts. You know what, I've made some versions of this and it's kind of like bread. It's kind of like a panettone in some versions, only not you know as high or rich. Um, I've seen things like Irish soda bread. So it's kind of interesting. Is there a depression cake recipe in your family? Refrigerator cake um, is simply that. Things that you put together, you put it in the refrigerator overnight and some of the things inside soften. Let me tell you what I mean. Upper left picture is uh, graham crackers with solo filling in between them, put turned on their side with a frosting of whipped cream and put in the fridge overnight. In the morning, you can slice it like that through the graham crackers and they will have softened. On the right, you can see like cross sections of the striations of some of them. Um, in this case, they put frosting across a bunch of cookies and then cut them on the diagonal to get uh, that version. Um, or they did it like in a cake form, like you see in the plates in front. In the lower left is my version of mushy cookie pudding, as my brother still calls it. My grandmother made this, my mom loved it. I've made a bunch of different versions for my family, but they insist on having it at every party. So it's jello pudding, alternate layers, and that's my St. Patrick's Day version with mint Oreos. You can also do graham crackers or vanilla wafers. Vanilla wafers is a favorite of my family too. I make it in a bread pan. I use vanilla or chocolate pudding. Depending on the holiday, my brother loves it when I dye them different colors. The 4th of July one is particularly hard to pull off, <laughs> but it's very rich. So I layer it in that bread pan overnight and either graham crackers, vanilla wafers, or Oreos will have softened by the next morning and then people serve it as a type of pudding. It's very good. It's a woman from the Chicago area named Clara Canuccieri who grew up uh, during the Depression. And she has passed away now, but she had a YouTube channel called Cooking with Clara. And there's a book also and with recipes in it that you can still find either at the libraries or online. And she talked about how she worked at the Hostess factory. And on her way home from work, she would gather dandelion leaves for her family for dinner. And her recipes are about stretching foods. Uh, and she talks about how her family used a lot of pasta and potatoes to make food stretch uh, so that they could fill up the family and have enough to eat. And it's amazing. She really still likes dandelion greens. And I know my mother still does too, but imagine that, making those treats during the day and then picking up weeds on the way home for your family to eat for dinner. Food disguises were popular in the 1930s, including pigs in blankets, mushrooms made out of cream cheese, and this bunny salad made from a canned pear half. Um, all kinds of different ways to disguise food and stretch it and make meals interesting with limited means. You can find them especially during this period. I think those bunnies do not look the most attractive, but definitely clever arrangement with the almonds and the vegetables. Can you imagine a chocolate bar being referred to as Hitler's secret weapon during the war? Um, so it was from the Hung History Channel's Hungry History site that the Mars company encountered soldiers eating small chocolate beads encased in a hard sugar shell as part of their rations. And then after the war, the soldiers came home and wanted those. And so they got a patent for the manufacturing process and they started making M&Ms. But it was back in 1937 that the Hershey's Chocolate Company was approached about creating a specially designed bar for the U.S. Army rations. 
Um, so the bar had to weigh four ounces, be high in energy, withstand high temperatures, and, quote, taste a little better than a boiled potato. And so the, they all said it was terrible. And you can tell that that one has been preserved all these years um, with barely a mark on it. And so the infantrymen actually even referred to it as Hitler's secret weapon. You can see why M&Ms became such a huge hit out of the war. Here's a sample of a rationing coupon from World War II. And so some of the different things that were rationed are listed below. It's like sugar, coffee, meat and cheese, uh, even canned milk. Um, my mother says that people used to trade coupons so they would have enough sugar to make birthday cakes or things that were needed. Um, so all the different things were rationed and the government was coming out with recipe books for how to make your rations stretch more and more and more things were rationed. So World War II did have a lot of issues with food and vegetables and things that people needed here to eat in this country. And so how did they make it work? So they used the rations and they also did victory gardens, which is the next slide. Photo on the left are girls from the Jane Addams High School working in their 200 by 40 foot victory garden from Portland, Oregon in May 1943. It's from the University of Illinois Extension site. Um, they have some photos of that time. Now, also from Hungry History, it says, as a result of the combined efforts, three million new garden plots were planted in 1917 and more than 5.2 million were cultivated in 1918 which generated an estimated 1.5 million quarts of canned fruits and vegetables. By the end of World War uh, I, home gardens had dropped off, but then in World War II, they came back with a vengeance. So and at the World War II Museum in New Orleans says that there were more than 20 million victory gardens for World War II. It's amazing, isn't it? And they produced 40% of all the vegetables in the U.S. So they really were keeping things going. Some of it was shipped and it fed people at home. Now the government came out with pamphlet books like the one on the right, Handbook for the Garden, um, and we'll talk about canning next. But there were some unusual recipes they suggested for things to do with your victory garden. And the one that scared me the most was the carrot fudge. Uh, it had carrots, gelatin, and orange essence. Doesn't that sound scary? From eatlocalchallenge.org, the Of Course I Can poster was created by the U.S. War Food Administration in 1944 as part of the Nationwide Victory Garden Program. They were teaching people how to preserve the stuff they were making in the victory gardens. I love the photos of the, on the right, the drawings of what not to do. It's didn't want people to get botulism uh, from the canned food. Uh, so canning was a common activity during World War II. 64% of women canned food for household use, but by 1943, it was up to 75%. And they said most of these families put up 165 cans or jars per year during the war. Now, did you know that during COVID that mason jars, there was a shortage of them? Uh, people were using them for craft projects and for canning while we were at home. And so if you think back to the time of World War II, they maybe didn't have the materials to do the canning. So there were 5,000 community canning centers where people could use the very large hot water baths and to do this safely. There was a lot of education on how to can properly. Um, so it was a whole effort from the entire country. And we definitely can't talk about World War II foods without spam. <laughs> so spam and i've been to the museum which is an hour outside of minneapolis uh spam was created by hormel foods in 1937 uh, the brother of the hormel foods president won a hundred dollars for naming it if you can imagine of it now a hundred million pounds of spam were shipped to the allied troops during world war ii so it really did help uh, us win the war. There were people starving in their countries where war had been going on for a while and the fields uh, and the men to till the fields, all of it, it was no longer operating and they didn't have as much to eat. So now we have spam. And even with people with rations here also like spam. So at home and shipped. Now what I find, because sometimes I serve cubes of spam when I give these talks in person, is that people either love it or hate it. And those that love it usually have a memory of a loved one making it. 
uh, making a dish that I remember when so and so made uh, spam sandwiches or spam this. So um, it's tied to memories in a lot of cases. Um, one of the marketing uh, quotes used by spam was no one likes gray meat. <laughs> That's amazing to think about. Um, in 1947, there was a group called the Hormel Girls that were performing across America and also advertising the spam. It's unreal to think about what an operation it was and that it's so closely tied to history. If you look on their website now, they do have cooking contests, and I put a couple photos from their uh, various ads through history here. Um, so take a look at it. There's like spam sushi. There's all kinds of creative, funny ways with the mystery canned meat. Do you like spam? Let's move on into the 50s, and we're going to talk about Chex Mix, which was considered a fancy party dish when it first came out. So Czech cereal was first introduced in 1888 by Ralston Purina, but by 1952 recipes for Czech's party mix appeared on boxes of Czech cereal. And that photo I have there is a box of cereal that someone found in a cabinet from that era and put on eBay. Uh, just the box notice with the original recipes. No one wanted to eat the cereal back from that time period. But it was not until 1985 that the prepackaged ones were introduced commercially. We that's the version a lot of us see now in the stores, and they have all kinds of crazy Chex Mix flavors. There was sriracha Chex Mix for a while. There's like sweet versions, um, but originally, is uh, in 1955, the wife of a Ralston executive in St. Louis served the snack at a holiday function. Um, and so then TV mixes were starting to become popular. And these were like snacks that could be consumed without interrupting television watching. Uh, and they appeared all over in the 50s as people got televisions at home. Uh, and there's a 1950 Betty Crocker cookbook with a recipe for a snack mix made out of Kix cereal. One of the favorite cookbooks in my collection is Carnation's Teen Time Cooking from 1959. Before the 50s, there really weren't teenagers. There was youth and then there were adults. And a lot of times they couldn't finish school because the adults needed their help working or they went off to war. But suddenly in the 50s, we have people moving to the suburbs. We have maybe teenagers who are allowed to finish high school, maybe even get part-time jobs. And so they have a little more spending money. So for the first time, we also see cookbooks directed just at teenagers who maybe are even entertaining for their friends. So this recipe uh, makes me smile. Five Minute Fudge is in every single church cookbook. Um, before Five Minute Fudge, people had to stand over the stove with a candy thermometer making fudge and stir for like half an hour. And I, I've done this. My grandma Curtin had a uh, recipe. One of her few handwritten recipes was for fudge. It was very hard with the candy thermometer. I even melted a candy thermometer down once when I stepped away to check some laundry. So now we have Five Minute Fudge, which can be made with marshmallow fluff or carnation uh, cooking. And there's a couple different versions of it. But here's what Carnation Teen Time says. Nothing doing this weekend? Well, it happens sometimes. But instead of being a sad Susie, why not get the girls together? Who knows? One of them may just have a brother or a cousin who's dying to meet someone new. And so they suggest making five-minute fudge. And it makes about two pounds, and they have it rolled with nuts and put in the fridge. And then you can pull it out and slice it and serve it. Uh, good for both boys and girls. Carnation's Team Time Cooking also has advice for how to host a dinner party for teens. Um, look at those gorgeous dresses. If I saw those in an antique mall or vintage clothing place, I would be all over them. Not that I'd be able to fit into them. Uh, boy, those are cute. But, and they suggest that you serve supper on a bread slice, which is a polite term for something that was known by a very different term during wartime. So the caption for this is, next time you are a guest, remember your own party. The hostess has gone to a great deal of time and effort to make the evening enjoyable. Do your part by appearing at your most attractive and pleasant self. Uh, so at your most attractive and pleasant self, you're supposed to serve supper on a bread slice. And that is four cans of luncheon meat. And we know what that means. Two tablespoons of horseradish, a cup of green pepper, two thirds of a cup of uh, carnation, two pounds of processed sliced American cheese, and two loaves of French bread. And you start by shredding the luncheon meat. Uh, and it goes on from there.
Now the food doesn't taste that bad. It's just hard to imagine it in the setting with those dresses. In the 1950s, we really see the rise of the casseroles, the all-in-one pot meal. And so from the 1958 Good Housekeeping Casseroles pamphlet book, there are a number of strange recipes. Now the one on the left, I know it's kind of hard to see, but it shows a trend of making like breakfasty type casseroles with toast points that kind of were on triangles above the casserole. Um, later on, we see ones that are layered or the pans are lined with bread. Uh, so that one has the toast points up and it's called sandwich casseroleette. It's made with four eggs and an entire quart of milk. And I'm not kidding. Uh, salt, mustard, bread slices, a brown and served sausages or 12 slices of bologna and sliced tomatoes. And it says heat the oven to 325. Beat the eggs slightly, mix in the milk, salt, and mustard. Make three two-decker sandwiches using sausages as the first layer uh, and sprinkled with grated cheese for the second. Have each sandwich diagonally arrange in baking dishes with cut sides down. Uh, that is a lot of work. And why would it need to be made in casserole form? You could make some fun breakfast sandwiches without doing that. Um, I really like the casserole on the cover of the pamphlet, too. It's got a lot of baked beans there. That might even be spam. Um, they have another recipe in here called a man's casserole with four cups of noodles, four medium onions. Okay, four onions. Wow. Two tablespoons of butter, two pounds of ground chuck, salad or olive oil, salt, pepper, dried thyme, one can condensed cream of celery, um, and diluted evaporated milk and then processed cheddar cheese. That does not sound healthy or like anything any man I know would like to eat. Next few slides cover the trend of making food look like cakes that you see starting in the 50s. Now, first of all, I'd like to comment that the hamburger and hot dog pamphlet cookbook uh, is not something we would see today. That's from 1958, and that looks raw. I mean, nobody would eat that today, or nor would they want to, nor would we see it on the cover of any kind of cookbook. But the trend I want to talk about is the frosted meatloaf. So you see they've made meatloaf on the left there, and it says, when loaf is baked, pour off all juices. Thickly frost top and sides with well-seasoned, creamy mashed potatoes. Sprinkle with paprika, broil until golden. Um, so you can put any kind of cheese on top there too. So you kind of frost the thing with the potatoes. Uh, I've seen a lot of versions of this one. I'm not sure why they wouldn't just want to serve the potatoes to the side. Um, I believe people thought it looked like the sandwich loaf, which is going to be my next slide. Here we have the sandwich loaf. A lot of times people associate this one with happy memories because it's usually like at a wedding or a baby shower or a retirement party, some kind of happy event. So usually we see it in a rectangular loaf that is cut the opposite way that we would slice bread today. And it's got things like ham salad or egg salad in the middle. The whole thing is frosted by a thick layer of cream cheese. So it looks like a cake. This is a round version of it from the Foodorama Party Book in 1959. This is party sandwich loaf, and it's got ham and celery filling, curried egg filling, and avocado filling. Um, and there is one, these were so popular, they're in all the different cookbooks, even the uh, Better Homes and Gardens children's cookbook, the red and white uh, checked one, they have a kid's version of the sandwich loaf. Um, that they thought the kids who wanted to cook should know how to make this. Uh, so it's kind of funny. In the 50s and 60s, all the vintage cookbooks tried to have, quote, Hawaiian recipes. And I put it in quotes because they didn't do research in a lot of cases. Um, if it had pineapple on it, it was Hawaiian. If it had macadamia and nuts in it, it was tropical. But there were some good recipes that came out of this trend. On the left is pineapple upside down cake, which is actually a recipe that had been around for decades already. But you see a resurgence of it um, as in a lot of interest in Hawaii and then the pineapple. Um, and what's fun now is that Wilton's has a pan where you can set the pineapples in and then pour the, the batter over it. And that is for those who have challenges baking like I do. <laughs> but in the 1953 250 classic cakes, um, they suggest a whole bunch of apps, upside down cakes like apple, apple gingerbread, maple apple. Don't those sound good? 
And then there's one like fruit cocktail. Um, there's one a huckleberry, there's a chocolate and an apricot. Some of those might be fun to try. Now the gem on the right is from actually 1974, Better Homes and Gardens. Um, that is called Fish Sticks Polynesian. Uh, <laughs> it says a good use for leftover rice. It sounds terrible. Uh, and that's supposed to be a volcano with uh, curls of lava, carrot lava coming out of it. Uh, it's probably tasty, the fish sticks with the rice and the carrots, but it definitely isn't something they served in Hawaii. And I always get a kick out of that recipe. It makes me smile. Often when you think of the 1950s, you think of soda fountains, right? At uh, drug stores, people sat there. Think about Back to the Future, how he went back and all, everyone was sitting at the counter at the uh, soda fountain. And so there were all kinds of delicious ice cream recipes and creations that came out of that time. On the left, from ice creams and cool drinks from Good Housekeeping. Uh, the ice cream is like an art form. Look at those fabulous drinks on the cover. Wouldn't you love to have one of those? And so they have all these amazing ones and recipes on how to decorate the inside of your glass, like with those chocolate swirls. Um, and there's tips on rolling ice cream balls and coconut, having flaming baked Alaska, different types of sauces. Now there's, at times they have some kind of crazy recipes because there is a jello prune one in there and an orange peppermint, which is hard to imagine. But then they also have like peach honey, which is the middle one on the cover. On the right is a Sunday spread from Better Homes and Gardens Holiday Cookbook. Um, it says for Father's Day, make a banana split uh, buffet. And, <laughs> and so that in theory, that sounds pretty good. Their flavor combinations are a little bit odd, uh, like minted pineapple um, and strawberry and mint chocolate chip and marshmallows. Uh, it's hard to imagine that. But the idea of an ice cream buffet would be fun uh, after COVID, of course. Uh, right now, it might be fun to just try different combinations of flavors in one serving. But definitely ice cream creations uh, came from the 50s. Now, atomic cake seems to be a uniquely Chicago thing, and I'll describe what is in this heavenly creation. But the name of it uh, is thought to have come from the late 50s, early 60s, with either interest in the space race or uh, in like the worry about nuclear weapons from Russia and like air raids and and the defense union and the things that they had going at that point. But atomic cake is heavenly and you can get it at certain bakeries uh, in the area. Most of these are on the south side of Chicago. Um, there was a bakery in Downers Grove that had them and so I went there to get it. It is like 12 layers, three different flavored layers of cake. Uh, and the one pictured I think has one layer of banana or yellow cake, one layer of chocolate cake, one layer of white cake, one to two fresh bananas and because you have fruit in between the layers and the fruit is mixed with pudding. And so then they have cherry and pudding and there's chocolate pudding in there and they top the whole thing with whipped cream. So this is multiple different layers and it would be fun to experiment with different flavors on this. I'd love to see like an apples and spice cake version of it. Um, but this is heavenly. Very hard to get all those layers on your fork. Definitely worth trying. It's out of this world. I have given talks on foods from the 1960s. But really, a lot of them aren't that good. Uh, and so some of the interesting ones from the 60s that a lot of people seem to remember is on the left, we've got the space food sticks. Everybody was interested in going to the moon then, right? Um, but these were like snack sticks that were designed to be slipped into a spaceman's helmet, which of course they weren't. The space program didn't bring them. But uh, a lot of people hated the flavor of these. So they didn't last that long. But I know a lot of people who have tried them. Almost every time I give a talk in person, somebody has tried the space food sticks. In the middle is Pop-Tarts. So Pop-Tarts, they were trying to make a, a food that people could eat on their way to breakfast, on their way to school, right? A quick breakfast they could have on their way to school, something that could go in the toaster. So the original ones did not even have the icing on it, which became so popular. But what was brilliant, about Kellogg's is that they marketed to teenagers and they did that by combining it with comic books. So you see this uh, box here had a Batman comic on it and they had all kinds of different uh, partnerships with the different characters as they as it grew more popular and they got more flavors and figured out how to do the icing in the toaster. So it was brilliant. I wonder if they hadn't 
uh, banded with the comic book people if Pop-Tarts would have been as popular. Some version of it would have been. And on the right are Little Debbie's snack cakes. In 1960, McKee Foods founder O.D. McKee was trying to come up with a catchy name for their new family pack carton of oatmeal cream pies. Um, and what he did was use his four-year-old granddaughter's likeness and name for his new company. And what makes me laugh is that even in the picture there, he's using his actual granddaughter to hawk the product. So the oatmeal cream pie is still their most popular product, uh, and that came out of the 60s. Now this concoction has a rabid following and I've never been able to figure out why this is carrot jello. It's been called sunset salad in some of the joys of jello books and it uses lemon or orange pineapple gelatin, which they no longer have, they have lemon, a salt, boiling water, a crushed pineapple or pineapple tidbits, lemon juice and grated carrots. And some versions have nuts in it too. Now I have had people tell me that I haven't uh, lived until I've had jello that crunches and I will take their word for it. Um, this was part of a time when jello was trying to prove that they didn't just they weren't just for dessert, right? So they had vegetables and they had vegetable flavored gelatins like uh, we all know about tomato aspic, but then there was one called Italian uh, dressing uh, flavored jello and there was uh, different vegetable, I think it was vegetable salad, jello, you get the idea. Ones that probably didn't go over for that long. They also had Coca-Cola jello flavored, but so they were trying to prove that they were not just for dessert. They also had meat jellos in the cookbooks. And I have a chapter of one that calls Eat and Stay Slim. And it's got like rolled up ham or shredded ham and eggs in the jello. Um, I'm not sure how that helps people stay slim. Uh, but it is kind of funny that they thought this was a version that would be healthier. Now, every year, the Pillsbury Bake Off is tied into products that you're trying to help sell. So Nordic Wear was down the street from Pillsbury in uh, Minnesota, and they were having trouble selling their Bundt cake pans. So this particular year, and this was 1966, they decided to make uh, have people come up with creations for the Bundt cake. And this was made with uh, a chemical reaction. It used to be before this time, the recipes, and I see this in my cookbooks, had people use electric knives and cut the middle out of cakes and fill them with ice cream or other fillings. Well, this person took um, a frosting powder, which they no longer have, and it formed this like lava in the middle of the cake. And this was called Tunnel of Fudge. And it came in second place. People are always like, well, who came in first? Nobody cares. There's lots of years like that with the Pillsbury Bake Off, where the first place maybe was trendy, but the second place kind of uh, stood the test of time with the flavors. And after that, the Bundt Cake sold a ton. Um, also in the background of this, you see uh, soda. And you see this in a lot of church cookbooks and uh, purchased cookbooks, uh, like store cookbooks, is that 7-Up and Coke cakes really came into their own and and the jello got in on that with the coca-cola flavored jello but seven up cake is still very popular and you can actually buy it at meyer if you like it my mother has fond memories of making salmon mousse when the irish cousins came to town it was like the only time they came uh, in her lifetime and so she wanted to make salmon mousse, which as we know was popular in the 60s. It was often done in a ring form with like some kind of potato salad or something in the middle. Um, so I decided to make it one Christmas for my mom and I bought the special fish mold and it was terrible. It was so bad. It used like lemon jello and vinegar and salmon and I have no idea why the color split in it. It just was so bad. But my mom and dad sat there and ate a lot of it at Christmas time because she was remembering the memories. They were remembering the happy occasion and obviously not the flavor. As we move into the 70s, we have to talk about centennial foods. You see, I have a cookbook there that is entirely centennial celebration foods from 1976. I also included some other kind of humorous things that went along with that time period. Imagine red, white, and blue shakes. I don't think they've had the blue ones since. Uh, and look at the Barbie outfit for the Centennial. I thought uh, it says the Betsy Ross dress that I don't think Betsy Ross wore. And we also have the firecrackers. And this is from uh, Great American Picnics from Red Book in July of 1976. 
whether a simple backyard party of the lavish frolics often held in the early 19th century. The picnic is an American institution. It is traditional to the 4th of July as the illuminations John Adams specified to be an appropriate observance of the day. Um, and so they suggest a lot of different foods for this, uh, including minced juleps, uh, grilled chicken legs, steak sandwiches, uh, trash can corn, banana split firecrackers. So that's what we're looking at there. And they are uh, dipped in like a blue dyed glaze. And then they have a little bit of whipped cream and a cherry on top. And those look like a lot of fun, even if we aren't celebrating another uh, anniversary like this one. This is another one of recipes that people remember fondly, but have mixed uh, feelings about the taste of it. So they remember seeing it at occasions, but perhaps they don't always enjoy eating it. And this is poke cake, or it was called in the 70s was Stripe It Rich. And you can tell these are pictures from the 70s because the preponderance of brown in the two top ones. Now, so what I hear from a lot of people is poke cake. You know, a lot of times you bake the cake, then you use a wooden dowel rod while it's still warm, and then you pour the flavored gelatin over it or um, the pudding. And most people do not like the flavored of the jello ones. They just think that tastes odd. It looks pretty if you have cut open the cake, right? But some of those flavors may not work together. I can't really imagine the orange and the lime on the top one. But the pudding works really well. And you see how they did it there. Uh, and that one has continued to be popular. And it comes in and out of fashion in different times. You remember we talked about depression cake? This is wacky cake or one egg cake. In the 70s, it came back with a vengeance. Only this time they advised making it in the form you see in the upper right corner where you dig out wells in the dry goods for the wet goods. Now I actually do that with a lot of cakes. A lot of people do. They dig one well and put in their wet goods, but for whatever reason, it became popular to do it that way. From NPR, I have wacky cake, war cake, Joe cake, crazy cake. What's in a name? A cake by any other name would taste as sweet, but it may not have this cake's history. Easy one pan chocolate cake could be a perfectly appropriate title for this cake because it's incredibly simple to make and can be mixed, baked, and served from the same pan. Somewhere along the way, someone decided to leave more to the imagination and coin the cake wacky. And so it's come from time periods where, uh, like the Depression, where maybe egg or flour or things uh, were hard to come by or during war times. So here it is in the 1970s version. This is from 1970s Gourmet International's The Fine Art of Fondue Chinese Wok and Chafing Dish Cooking. Uh, I have a whole chapter on flaming foods in this one, which is kind of funny, like Cherry's Jubilee, but crepes were very popular, as you know, in the 70s, as was fondue. The crepes on the left are ones I made. And yes, I realize they don't look too good, but it was delicious. It was a chocolate peanut butter sauce and a crepe wrapped around the banana. I actually made it with my boys. Um, you don't have to be able to use a special crepe pan or to flip them to, to be able to enjoy crepes if you want to try them. So I want to encourage you because, as we know uh, from my photos, mine don't always turn out well, but... Um, I do enjoy trying new things, but these were delicious. On the right is pink squirrel uh, fondue, and it is it uses uh, a jar of marshmallow cream, uh, three tablespoons uh, creme de almond, one tablespoon white uh, creme de, de cocoa, one teaspoon of lemon juice, and banana or strawberry dippers. Uh, it looks like Pepto-Bismol, right? I mean, certainly you could just use uh, almost anything else <laughs> and make something uh, just as delicious. I have used white chocolate or white almond bark uh, in there and dyed it red for the holidays. My teen advisory board, I remember they walked in when I had done that one year and I think I added peppermint uh, flavoring and they're like, oh, she's made some weird vintage thing again. Um, that one was tasty, but the color is definitely off-putting. I just talked about flaming foods. Here it is. Here's Cherry's Jubilee made with a chafing dish. Uh, here's the recipe for it. The brandy is, of course, what you light up. Uh, and it says it's good with vanilla ice cream. This was considered a very romantic dessert. Uh, and if you think about it, what other foods have you had that uh, have the flaming aspect to it? There's cakes. You can put cups of things in the middle of cakes and set them on fire. You can soak raisins in alcohol and set those on fire. 
Um, and <laughs> I probably know way too much about those kind of things. Uh, but this one is Cherry's Jubilee, and it was popular at least through the 60s and into the 70s. Here we have Watergate Salad and Cake. Uh, this one became popular because the Jello Pistachio Pudding came out, uh, and it's used in both of these recipes, as they're known. But the one on the left is a variation that we see a lot. Uh, it was frozen fruit salad in the 50s, and it's got marshmallows and bits of fruit like pineapple or or mandarin oranges. And it's got uh, some versions have like marshmallow fluff. Uh, this version also has pistachio pudding in it. Uh, so Watergate salad was named that because it was these two things were served at parties during that time. They were popular. And that's what people were talking about. So they got dubbed Watergate salad and cake. Uh, and the one is double pistachio uh, pudding cake. Uh, and you can find it if you type Watergate cake, you will find versions of that one. So it's not just dyed green, although I think that one is enhanced. I always say to people, what do you think cakes and salads would be named for parties now? We are moving into the 80s with some of these foods. And this is the dirt cake which really became popular in the 80s. Now I see a lot of cupcake versions of this. I see like that is the easiest way to serve it right now, especially with COVID, is to put like the graham crackers on the bottom or the Oreo mixed with cake or mixed with pudding uh, layers with the gummy worms on top. Lots of fun versions of this. The one in the middle um, used to be shown in all kinds of magazines and that and I made another version of it called Kitty Litter Cake for my teen advisory board, uh, for real. And it is kind of a precursor to cake pops. So you make a 9 by 13 cake, but then you crumble it up with pudding. And you add like Oreos, uh, ground up Oreos on top. And this one had Cool Whip Goats that you're looking at and Milano cookie tombstones and different Halloween decorations. And that's cute. But I wanted to make the version that looked like kitty litter for my teen advisory board uh, Halloween party. So I used like ground up graham crackers on top and then I put Tootsie Rolls on there. And honestly, the cake was delicious. But I still have teens to this day who are in that group talk to me about that cake. I threatened to bring one to one of their uh, bridal showers recently but i didn't do it it would have been funny that cake was delicious all right and on the right is mud pie so i think big in excess from the 80s you know big tall mud pie that was like a million calories had all kinds of alcohol on it served at restaurants uh alcohol ice cream peanut butter what's not to love to go along with our over the top 80s um, we have the blocked picture of the spokesperson for Jello Pudding Pops. Jello Pudding Pops, you can't get those anymore. Uh, those were huge. Um, what you can get is Jello and Jello Pudding in the cup form, but they don't have the pops like they used to. And of course, we don't talk about the spokesperson. And then on the left, I have a picture of Reese's Pieces. So Reese's Pieces were used in the movie E.T. because Eminem said no. Do you think Reese's Pieces would still be around if M&Ms were used? It's hard to imagine. Uh, and you can't imagine E.T. without the little Reese's Pieces. Skittles also came out in the 80s uh, and has certainly stayed popular. Other things like Pop Rocks came out. So and the origins of frozen yogurt. So in the 80s, we had TCBY and frozen yogurt, which had kind of an odd aftertaste. Right. But then in the 90s, there came a whole like profusion of uh, yogurt places. And this has continued on into the thousands. And there was Pinkberry and suddenly it became fashionable to have frozen yogurt. And it didn't really have that Africa taste anymore. All right. So the Food Network came out in April 19th, 1993. Um, and look at the cake I have in the upper right. Uh, and they show people carrying these things around without breaking them. Uh, it's hard to imagine food life without the Food Network now, even if you've never made any of these fantastical creations, they are fun to watch. Um, and on the left, we have the mini lava cakes made a resurgence and they were suddenly appearing in New York restaurants again, and they are still a version of that tunnel of fudge from the 60s. So what are some of the more recent trends? Well, whoopie pies were very big a few years back, as were cupcakes on everything. Cupcake wedding cakes, uh, cupcake everything, fancy cupcakes, uh, cupcake bakeries. And those have still kind of stuck around. 
But the whoopie pies uh, certainly were a trend there for a while. And I got this book out of the library and they even have savory ones made with cornbread and like a cream cheese and pepper filling. But what we see a lot in recent years is mini desserts and mini treats, but not necessarily healthier. So there's mini baked donuts, and uh, those are fun to do if you if you have that pan. You can easily get it from Wilton or other places. Uh, those are a lot of fun to make, and you bake them instead of frying them, and then you can decorate them as you like. Um, but I also have seen like dessert shooters at restaurants. Uh, when I vaguely remember going to restaurants before. Uh, so those are not necessarily healthier, but they're a small bite of popular sundaes and things that people don't want to order the whole dessert. of course, cake pops. And as I mentioned from when I talked about the kitty litter cake, cake pops are made from crumbled up cake mixed with frosting and then formed into shapes. There's all kinds of books from Bakerella, who is the blogger who really made these popular. She used to sell them at like a farmer's market in New York. And she has this book where you make them into all kinds of amazing shapes and decorate them. And it's pretty tough. Uh, my son got a brain mold and made brain cake pops, and those are pretty awesome for Halloween. But some of these more elaborate ones are very hard, and you have to melt the candy melts and dip them in there and then get the decorations just right. But it's awfully fun to try and work and do them. Have you ever made cake pops? So what will be the next top? popular flavor. I put a picture of the Instapot here because that seems to be very big right now. Also air fryers. But what kind of treats and desserts will continue to stay popular? And as I mentioned, the cupcakes, I think they will. This is a picture from my 1956 Good Housekeeping Cake Book. And they suggested that you decorate all these different cupcakes for one party. Now, while some of those look like the baker got tired, like the two that are stuck together, the two halves at the bottom, there are some beautiful, elegant ones in here that aren't that hard to do. There's one in there that's dipped in a chocolate ganache. There's one that's frosted that looks like little cherries or rolled in coconut. So while some of these trends may be very popular right now, they might have their roots in past decades, as I've shown you in this talk. What are your favorite desserts to make and to eat?